With that said, the title of my talk today is The Price is High. The Price is High. In John Maxwell's book, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, you know that book, Tim. I bought you a copy. Chapter 18 is entitled The Law of Sacrifice. The subtitle reads, A Leader Must Give Up to Go Up. The basic premise of this chapter is that in order to move forward, in order to make progress in life, in order to make your dreams a reality, students, there is a price you have to pay. Many times this price is unspoken. In other words, you can't always see it, but know, students, that it's always there. Do not ever allow yourself to think that anything in life is free. In fact, nothing worth having in life is free, except, except, Tina and I talked about it yesterday, accept the fact that everything costs something. Also, do not allow yourself to think that money is the only currency needed to make your dreams come true. In fact, in many cases, money is the least valuable currency needed. What I have learned and am still learning in my life is that the true cost of dreams, the true and real cost to make dreams, thoughts, and handwritten computer, tablet, or iPhone-typed goals a reality are the things that money cannot buy. After having lost a number of people in my life to death, such as my father at 16 to a massive and unexpected heart attack, my grandfather in 2009 to cancer, a high school classmate when we were still in high school in his sleep, and a fraternity brother, Chad Lamar Mackless, here while still a student at Centenary. What I've learned from those situations is that money is important. But are you willing to give up and pay in currencies such as your time, which none of us will ever get back once it's gone. Emotional heartache and pain, which many times can be more deadly over the long run than breaking a bone physically or dealing with other hard and challenging health concerns, or even pay the price to achieve and sustain the mental fortitude and stamina to press forward when no one else believes in you and many call you names and desert you when you know that what you are saying or trying to do is right and good. This is the price that I believe Dr. King knew very well. And he paid it in ways that we know about and in ways that we still have yet to imagine. This is the currency. The currency of having to have, uh, to leave loved ones behind and family members behind in order to pursue your greater goals and dreams. The price of not being called popular or even being alone to pursue your purpose and stoke your passions, to give yourself a chance, just a chance to make your dreams uh, happen and make them a reality. These are the unspoken costs of purpose, such as leaving the familiar behind that drove the ones we still talk about today, long after they are gone, to do things that they could not have done on their own. I believe God was working through them to empower them to persevere in ways they didn't even know they could do at the time. The things that they pursued were bigger than them. They were unselfish, they were focused on others, and they allowed the suffering of hate and bigotry around them to fuel their pursuit of justice and love. Having shared this, I wanna tell you all three stories today. Three stories, that's it, they're short, and after that I'll be done and I'll take my seat. The first story I call from D to degree. From D to degree, I have a feeling someone needs to hear these three things. Someone just needs to, and so I just have to say them. But during my first semester as a freshman at Centenary, I was a biology major. Notice how I said was. <laughs> that quickly changed. After lots of work, studying, and dedication, I still not do, did not do well in Biology 101. In fact, I made the only bad grade I've made in 22 and a half years of school. I made my first D, and I was crushed. It was tough, but I returned to school for my spring semester uh, more determined than ever. I also switched majors. <laughs> that was the spring of 2003. As you can imagine, my GPA wasn't very good after that first semester, but 
By the end of my four years, I had brought my cumulative GPA up to a 3.0. I was eligible to apply for most graduate schools and I was able to finish and graduate on time with a Bachelor of Arts degree as planned. If I had not held on to my faith, if I had not held on to my faith, I would not have made it through. Remember, students, it is not always about how you start the race, but more importantly, it's how you finish the race. It's about how you persevere. My second story relates directly to the chapter of John Maxwell's book that I mentioned a few minutes ago. I call it, Give Up to Go Up. Give Up to Go Up. What many people don't know is that the doctorate I earned was through an accelerated program, not a traditional one. It was an on-campus program, not online, so it was traditional in that sense in terms of geographic location, but it was essentially created for working professionals. The program was intense, but if done correctly and on time, it could yield a doctorate degree in two years. By comparison, the average doctorate degree in the social sciences can take someone roughly five years to complete. I'm thankful to say that this degree took me two and a half to finish. Now what made the program accelerated was that my classmates and I had to complete our initial drafts of the review of the literature in our research areas as part of our application to be admitted into the program. Instead of later in the program, after we completed all of our classes, as is done in a more traditional program. We also had to continue our research on our current chosen dissertation topics while taking a full course load and working full time. These were the initial years of centenarian Paris here at the college. So it required me to take books with me to Paris for both trips. If you remember in the first year we did a faculty exploratory trip, Mark, in May, you and I and Dana and a few others. And then we took all the students to Paris later in August. So I had books on the plane, I had books in my room, I carried books with me practically everywhere I went. When we returned, I carried books with me for trips home on the holidays. My mother remembers me reading in the room by myself. During the summer, I had books with me and anywhere else where time for reading could be carved out each day. After our first year in the program, me and my classmates were scheduled to take comprehensive exams. Comps, as we called them, they were an eight-hour essay examination, eight hours long, covering everything we learned to that point in the program based off the graduate courses we had already completed. We also had to turn in a completed draft of the first three chapters of our dissertations. Now, how do you think I did all that? Students, sometimes if you want it bad enough, if you want it bad enough, you have to give up, give up something in order to go up or move up to where you want to be. I named the summer leading up to my comprehensive examination the summer of sacrifice. My motto at that time was the sacrifices of my 20s will pay off in my 30s. In fact, I often repeated that to myself in the 2910 building where my office was, and especially during my drives to and from Jackson, Mississippi each month. I recorded all of my class notes on my phone and practically every morning that summer, I ran outside or went to the gym and listened to my notes. I also listened to my notes as I drove to and from work in my car. Then when I was at work, and Mark only on my lunch break, <laughs> I studied there as well. Also, after driving to Jackson, Mississippi from Shreveport, Louisiana 26 times for two and a half years, at three and a half hours each way, plus ga gas money and tuition each semester, as well as invaluable time away from my newlywed wife, our home, and other things I valued, I paid the price. Out of my 25 classmates, only eight of us graduated on time that December in 2014, which is the first time that any of us were eligible to, gra to graduate. And I say clearly and strongly, glory to God, that I was one of them. He made that happen. Sometimes you have to do what you might not want to do in order to be where only a few can be. 
Sometimes you have to do what you might not want to do in order to be where only a few can be. Not everyone is willing to pay the price. However, when an opportunity presents itself, let the other stuff go and focus on what's in front of you. In Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62, it says, As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus said, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. And I tell you all my story, and that story from the Bible too, because pursuing your dreams will be uncomfortable. It will be uncomfortable. In most cases, to make your dreams a reality, you will have to leave behind what you are familiar with. Sometimes walk the path alone and persevere in ways you never imagined. How comfortable was it for Dr. King to receive death threats? How comfortable was it for him to leave his wife at home with their children alone to go help another community where they don't even live that is struggling with human relations issues that he may never see the change, never see the change of his presence from. He may never see it come about due to his presence and his time there, yet he went anyway. I believe that we are a called to go to. You never know when becoming a doctor a lawyer, a teacher, a professor, a faculty member, or whatever it is that you want to do throughout your many stages of life, you never know when it will come back to save someone else's life. I didn't say change someone else's life. I said save it. My last story is called Emotional Costs. Emotional Costs. Just this past Thanksgiving in 2018, just a couple months ago, members of my wife's family came to visit us and stay with us for the week of Thanksgiving. We hosted five family members for four days, and then her parents came and met us about halfway through the week up in Tennessee. We had a blast. Of those seven family members, three were little kids. One was four, the middle was seven, the oldest was nine, my mother told me that after they left, I would miss the sounds of their little feet running up and down our stairs, the football against the wall. <sighs> I'll leave that alone. At the time when she told me, I honestly said to myself, internally of course, no I won't mom, no nah, I won't miss it. However, it only took a couple weeks and yes I did. My mom was right. You see, after hosting family for a week, and many of you know this, it can make you tired just a little bit. Not tired of having them, we love them, but it's a lot of energy. So I was mentally drained and wanted some fun. So I called up a friend in town, and we decided to go play a round of golf. The weather that day was great. It was chilly, but not too cold. We had a great time laughing, joking, and playing some, I'll say, decent golf. However, on our way, walking up to the tee box on the 18th hole, the last hole of the day, I noticed something. You see, the 18th hole at this course runs parallel to the 10th hole. Then on the other side of the 10th hole is a small trailer park. A chain link fence separates the trailer park from the golf course. In the distance, I could see two young teenage boys. On the other side of that fence, one had a basketball in his hand. And I honestly didn't think anything of it at the time. As we prepared to hit our tee shots, my friend was up first. As he prepared to tee off, out of nowhere and unexpectedly, I heard a word said loudly that I never thought I would hear at that time. The word that was said loudly was the word nigger. I immediately stopped what I was doing and stood still. 
I didn't turn towards them and thought to myself, did I really just hear that word right now? I said to myself, no, I'm going to leave it alone. I won't worry about what I think I just heard. Well, not even 30 seconds later, I hear that same word again, but even louder. I then decided to look around. I said to myself, who are they talking to? Surely they aren't screaming that way over here at me. However, when I looked around, and admittedly it was late afternoon at this point, no one was around. And my friend that I was playing with at the time was white. At that point, I realized something. They were trying to talk to me, but I didn't do anything. Finally, it was my turn to tee up. As I put my ball on the tee and backed up to prepare to swing, I heard that word a third time, and I got mad. Someone needed to hear this today, Mom. That third time, I got mad. However, and this is key, I took that negative energy and I did two things with it. Emily, Emily Aubrey, Eddie, y'all would be proud. I did two things with that energy. The first thing I did was channel that energy into my golf swing and I hit the prettiest four iron off that tee you ever did see. I then found my ball in the fairway, not in the woods, Eddie, in the fairway, and I hit a five iron just as sweet. The second thing I did when I got to my car a few minutes later after we finished the round that, that we just played is I prayed. I prayed, yes I prayed. I prayed for those two young men because someone taught them that. Someone taught them to do that. And they didn't know what that word meant or the historical implications of that word. I then asked God to forgive them and that he would touch them, bless them, and give them what they were lacking in life. You see, back in November 6, 1956, Dr. King gave a sermon at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. Students, if you don't hear one thing that I've said today, listen to this. In that sermon, he said, let no man pull you so low as to hate him. Let no man pull you so low as to hate him. I tell you this story today because it is time that we in this country stop hating one another for what we see and start loving people for who we are. It is time for us to see the similarities in one another. It is time for us to see the need and share in the supply that God has given each of us. 1 John, the third chapter, verses 16 through 18, it says, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and see a brother or sees a brother and sister in need, but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say we love each other. Let's show the truth by our actions. As we continue into 2019, I think that's our call to action. I think our challenge to ourselves each day is self. How can I show someone just one person love today? Can I spare five minutes to listen to someone who is frustrated, just one person? who might be down on themselves or upset. Can I listen? Can I take five minutes to write them a kind note or email? How can I encourage someone? Can I spare five dollars to help someone have a good lunch who forgot their money or frankly doesn't have any money in the first place? If I have three hats and it's cold outside and I see someone on the corner who is homeless or just doesn't have something over their head, can I stop and have the courage to give them one of my hats so that they won't get sick standing in the cold all night? These are the little things, yet the important things that we can do to make a positive difference in the lives of others. Lastly, 
excuse me, lastly, and I'll close. How are you defining success in your life? How are you defining success in your life? Is success checking all the boxes in a day? Trust me, I've been a cereal box checker for a long time. I say have been because lately I've learned and I'm still learning, life isn't about checking all the boxes. Checking boxes only gets you so far. No, what I'm learning is that life is about obedience to God, loving others, and walking in faith. All of us in this room are special. We each have been equipped with specific gifts, skills, and talents. How are you using your gifts, skills, and talents to positively impact the lives of others each day? And finally, from his sermon called The Drum Major Instinct, given on February 4th, 1968. I used to teach about this in that CO 153 class, the last sermon he gave from his home pulpit before his assassination. Dr. King said this, everyone can be great because anyone can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. Don't tell Dr. Cotton Kelly or Dr. Pacrell I said this part, but it also said, I'm just quoting Dr. King, you don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics and physics to serve. Now, students for your physics you know, exam, you may have to know that, so don't tell them Dr. LeVan said you didn't have to know that. But he ends it and he says, you only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. Thank you. Thank you.